in which you can take the exam. And once you start the exam, uh, there will be a timer. Uh, you have to submit the exam within that timer. Uh, so that all these details will be provided uh, early next week after Labor, Labor Day. Okay, so we'll continue talking about uh, NDSP. We covered uh, convolution last time. I'll go through uh, what happens when you have separable impulse response or when you have a separable impulse response and a separable input signal. And then we'll talk about support extension, uh, very quick uh, overview of some kind of arithmetics for images. And then we will conclude with the frequency responses of um, two dimensional um, systems. Uh, another way to describe uh, the impulse response in the frequency domain using Fourier transform. Um, so uh, this is uh, we at the end uh, of last lecture, we talked about uh, these special cases when uh, we have an impulse response that is separable. Um, so in here, uh, the assumption we have the definition. Uh, so we have the two dimensional uh, convolution definition. The output G is double summation over K and L. And then we chose to have the impulse response with the variables and the indices of K and L. These are the summation variables. Uh, and then F, uh, we mirror F around the X and the Y axis. So we have M minus K and M minus L uh, in, in this definition. And now the special case uh, that we are talking about in here is when we have the impulse response H of M and N is separable. So separable means it is the product of two one dimensional sequences, in this case, W and B. W of M and V of N. So what will be uh, happening in this case? So uh, we start with the definition and then we replace uh, H of K and L with the product of these two one dimensional sequences, W and V. And then reordering some uh, of our summation to over K in here, W of K uh, doesn't depend on L, so we can take it outside the summation over L. And then what we have left is summation over L, V of L, F of M minus K and N minus L. Um, so could you please mute your, uh, your mic? I can, I, I can hear some typing. Thank you. Um, so in here, uh, what we have uh, if in the L axis, in the L direction, well, you can look at this expression within the, uh, the rectangle in here as a one dimensional convolution, as we talked about in more detail last time. So if you take f of m uh, n minus l, and then you convolve uh, with v, then just assume that the resulting signal, we'll call it d, and then this D will be still function of M minus K as is. And then the convolution in the L direction will give you uh, the variable N in here. Okay. And now what we have left from the previous line is the summation over K and W over uh, of K. And then we have double summation over K, W of K, and then D signal. And this is again another one dimensional convolution in the k direction or over the k as a variable and that will give you the final results so we can using this plug diagram have the input f of m and n output is g if you have h of m and n if h of m and n is separable as a product between v and w then i can have two steps. The first step is a one-dimensional convolution, and the second step is another one-dimensional convolution. This, um, I can really first, in plain English, take f of m and n. First of all, I take the columns, I convolve every column with the signal v, and then the resulting uh, intermediate signal, 
I take every row in that signal and then convolve that with W. And then I get my G at the output. Or I can do the other way around. I take F, I take every row, I do the one dimension convolution row wise, and then I have an intermediate signal. And then for this intermediate signal, I take each column, I do the one dimension convolution column wise for every column, and then the results will be G of N and N in this case. So that's basically the separability property when I have an input response that is separable. Um, another special case, when you have both the impulse response, H, as separable, the product between W and V, and F, the input signal, is also separable as a product between S and R. So now both of these are separable sequences. The input and the impulse response are both separable. Then if I use the definition of our two-dimensional convolution, what I will do the next step, replace F with the product of S and R, replace H with the product between W and V. And then here, I can really uh, group these based on the indices. So I have summation over K, S of K times W of M minus K. None of these depends on L. And then the second term in here uh, is summation over L, R of L, V of N minus L. None of these depend on K. So the one on the left-hand side is a one-dimensional convolution over the variable k, and the one on the right-hand side is a one-dimensional convolution over the variable l. So uh, this one, the first one will give me a signal in the m, um, g1 of m, I just call it g1, and then the second one-dimensional convolution will give me the output g2, and then the output g of m and n is the product of g1 and g2, in here, which means if I have the input as a separable signal, the impulse response is separable uh, sequence, then the output will also be separable in this in this case. And this is an example we did last time. And if you look more carefully, uh, both of these, uh, the impulse response, the unit step function, uh, U of M and N, it's separable. And uh, F of M and N, which is uh, one, within a certain uh, region between zero and capital M and zero capital N in the first quadrant is one. That is also a separable, which is really F of M and N, if you wanna write it down, is nothing but U of M and N minus U of M minus capital M and N minus capital N in this case. So it's also separable. Uh, so you can really do what we did last time, get the two dimensional convolution, or you can convolve uh, U of M um, times U of M minus U of M minus capital M will get you G1 of M. Do the second uh, one dimensional convolution, you get G2 of N. Do the product between G1 and G2, and what you will get is this G of M and M. Uh, you can try it at home uh, by hand um, just to see if you get the same results. And then now let's look at uh, what kind of computational savings we have um, when we uh, utilize this separability uh, as a feature. Uh, so let's just, for the sake of assumption, that F is a square uh, signal. So F is the size of N times N. And also H is square and the size is capital N times capital M. And now the dimension of the operator or the impulse response H is much smaller than the size of the input signal F. Um, if that's the assumption um, from this definition here of the two-dimensional uh, convolution is the double summation of H of KL times F. Now, what is the dimension of F uh, convolved with H? We know that the dimension will be M plus N minus one by N plus N minus one. So we have M plus N minus one square uh, samples uh, in our output, and each one of these samples, they will require this many products, right? How many of these is the dimension of H of K and L, which is not, when it's not zero. And what is that? Is M times N. So we'll have N times M multiplications or M squared multiplications for every single point or sample in the output G of M and N or 
the output of the convolution of f and good edge. So this is how many samples we have in the output, and each sample requires m squared multiplication. So if you do this uh, simplification um, uh, calculations, we'll get this number in here. And then if we impose the fact that uh, capital M is much more than capital N, then we can really do an approximation that the number of multiplication we need for this two-dimensional operation is N squared N squared. Now, if you take the special case and uh, H is simple, now, um, if you remember what that means, we can perform two one-dimensional convolution, convolution in um, uh, consecutively. So the first case, we take D of M and N that we had uh, three previous slides, which is defined here. So now, what's the size of D? That's in one direction, it's the same size as the input F, which is N. And in the other direction, it depends, are you really convolving the rows first uh, or the columns? Um, either way, so uh, in either case, in one direction, it's the same as the size of F. In the other direction, we have N plus M minus one. So the size of D now is capital N times N plus M minus one. This is how many points we have or samples we have in the signal D, the intermediate signal uh, D. So the number of multiplication that we need to obtain this D is, uh, is basically the same as N, the dimension, N times N plus N minus one. And for each one of these, which is basically from here, how many product do we need here? Is the size of V, right? Which is M in this case, right? Remember our H is still M by M and the separable that means W and V, both of them uh, are, uh, are capital M in length. Um, so this how much, uh, how many multiplications we need to obtain D. You can approximate that because the fact that capital M is much smaller than capital N, then uh, these two terms can be very, very small compared to the first term, which is N squared N. And now, once we have D, now we operate on uh, the other, either we, if we did the rows first, now we do the columns, or if we did the columns first, now we do the rows. And now the size of F of uh, convolved H with, or G at the output is this how many points, right? As, uh, just as in the case one. And now for each point, uh, do we need this many multiplication? And this many multiplication is determined by the size of W, which is in this case capital N. So we have capital N times the size of G, the output is how many samples we have, N plus M minus one square. And then this is how many multiplications uh, do we have. Again, uh, we can do the approximation here because the fact that uh, M is much smaller than capital N, when we are talking about uh, capital N can be 1024 um, pixel wise, and then capital M can be three by three or five by five. So it's really, really much smaller than capital N. Uh, so we can approximate this to be N squared M. So we need two N squared M uh, in the case approximately in the case when H is separable. So this is uh, definitely smaller than what we had if you don't really impose uh, or utilize the separability of H as a feature, which was N squared, M squared. So there's an order of M uh, to M, uh, M over two, sorry, in this case. So here's an example. And if you have F and H, both of them are separable, then that becomes even um, uh, more saving. Uh, so just to put things into perspective as an example, uh, if you have the input image as 1000 by 1000, um, 1024 by 1024 pixels, and H is a filter of size nine times nine, um, then in this case, uh, in the one, if you don't use uh, two consecutive one convolution, one dimension convolutions, you are in talking very close to 85 million multiplications. If you utilize the fact that your H or your operator uh, is, is separable, then we are talking about around 19 million multiplication. So there's quite a bit of saving um, in, in, in this case because of the separability, uh, uh, separability uh, feature. Any question before we proceed?
So now um, what we will talk about next uh, is the support region. The fact that if you look at the LSI systems, uh, when we have usually in this course, uh, the input signals are really natural images. And then uh, we have a finite support for these images, uh, meaning that you don't really go to infinity. There is a, there is a, a finite region of support, a, a finite dimensionality uh, to, to describe these input signals. And then when you have an operator operating on these signals, then the output will be larger than the input size because of the n plus n minus one uh, um, uh, that we talked about. So that's kind of a, usually you want to keep both of these input and the output uh, with the same dimension. So you don't really have distractions in the display of these, uh, of these images. And then um, in other words, um, and also when you have your operator, uh, because of the finite support, uh, your operator, if you are operating, on, let's assume the first pixel on the upper left corner of the image, then what you need is to use uh, images or pixels or values from outside the, the support region of the input image. So in that case, uh, what uh, one of the options is to zero pad your input image, um, right? So zero padding, uh, that, uh, that will work because you will Assume basically the surrounding areas are zeros. However, oh, that will introduce some uh, some artifacts uh, in your some artifacts in your output image. And also, um, if you do some kind of cropping uh, to get rid of uh, the difference in the sizes, uh, then the fact that you have this cropping function after you do an LSI system then the overall system is not LSI anymore, right? Um, so that's a, uh, is a minor issue, uh, but uh, it's nevertheless is an issue uh, that uh, we have to worry about. So, um, so now um, the question is, uh, what are the common practices? And the next few minutes and what we are talking about, these are recommendations, these are, um, some ways uh, there is nothing called uh, correct or wrong. Uh, you can really uh, decide on which of these methodologies you want to use based on uh, the type of image that you are dealing with. Uh, but regardless of all of that, as far as, especially in your project, as far as you are keeping in mind that around the boundary regions, there is something um, happening because you are uh, padding uh, the, the image with zeros or some other values, as far as you're keeping that in mind, uh, then uh, you'll be okay. Um, what I'm talking about is assume you are doing some denoising and then, um, then when you are calculating the quality of your output of the denoising algorithm, and now the question is, can you, uh, shall you include the boundaries of the image into that calculation as well. Uh, as far as you are really comparing apples to apples, if you are applying different algorithms from other papers and you are comparing, if you are including the boundaries uh, in the calculation, the quality for both methods, that's fine. If you are not including them and you are really including only a sub image that doesn't include the boundaries for both values, for both methods, then that's fine. As far as you are keeping that in mind, uh, you should be, you should be fine. So there are four, and this doesn't mean that uh, there are only four algorithms, but these are four common practices uh, that are being used in the literature, um, uh, how you can really pad your image. So the first one is uh, to pad with the mean values. The second is row or column repetition period extension, and finally, the symmetry extension. We just talk about each one of these very quickly uh, before we talk about the frequency response. So in the mean value, uh, this is your image that you are starting with, a two-dimensional signal uh, for, uh, uh, for now, F. And then what you do is you say, um, I want to really pad around it, uh, not zeros, but really the average or the mean value of all the pixels within F. So that's what really F bar uh, means in here. So all these pixels in here are the same values. And how far you go, uh, basically the dimensionality here or here, 
it depends on the size of H, right? Because remember, uh, if this is your uh, image F, this is the pixel, and then you are really centering H around this pixel. So this is how much you need uh, to operate on this pixel uh, so that you are padding. So that's really determine how far you wanna go uh, outside the boundaries of the image. So in this specific case, uh, if zeros will introduce quite a bit of discontinuity, uh, then maybe the mean average will be less uh, problematic. And this whole idea is basically the, the output image, uh, what you will have, the boundaries in here will have artifacts, right? Um, so the second uh, methodology is uh, row repetition or column repetition. You take your image F, and then you take every row in here, and then you repeat it. So what you will have, you'll have another F here, another F here, another F here, another F here, So you repeat your image F, and it depends on what the size you are looking for, this, this becomes your input image, okay? So that's basically you have a repetition of your column and or Android uh, in this case. And then another one is a periodic extension. That's as if you are really, it's the same as the number two. Uh, the only difference is that you are really doing some kind of, uh, in the first one, you are, uh, sorry, in the number four, you are doing some kind of mirroring. In number three, as if your rows are really coming from a, per a periodic signals, and the same thing for the column as with number two. Um, so all of these are uh, are are examples of uh, of how you can really do the padding. Uh, if you just say I want to keep things easy for me, I just want to pad the zeros. That's absolutely fine. Uh, I just want to mention this uh, in case uh, there's a question about it. Uh, So uh, there's a question about, um, as an input, can a natural image be inseparable? Uh, most natural images, um, actually all of them, uh, uh, they are not really separable. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very difficult to find uh, two one-dimensional uh, sequences uh, whose product uh, will produce the natural image. In computational imaging, that's a different story. Uh, it's possible based on how you set up uh, the, the, the computation and the imaging. Um, the second question. Uh, so the intuition behind the artifact, except from zero padding, and how they could be reduced by mean value extensions. Yes. Um, so uh, if I take this as, as an image F, if I pad with zeros in here, right? Let's put this one, one side, right? So it depends on what kind of pixels in here, uh, what kind of values uh, we have. Let's assume the intensity values is something between zero and 25, let's say 100. So when you have a zero and then jump next to it to 100, that's a high frequency, that's an edge, that's a high frequency component. Um, so now uh, the next, the output uh, of, of the image, uh, when you do pad zero padding, um, as if you are really assuming there was a very sharp or an edge or high frequency content at the very beginning of the image. It depends on what you are doing. If you're doing averaging filter, for example, then you are really um, uh, doing a very, very blurry effect uh, for the, around the boundaries of the image. Um, now, if you replace those, so assume the values in the first column are all in the 100 range. If you replace the values in here or the pad, you don't really pad with zeros. Uh, instead of padding with zeros, you pad with the average. And let's say the average is 50. Uh, so the intensity value for the mean value is 50. So now when you are doing an averaging filter, for example, uh, then between the 50s and the 100, it's nicer in terms of how much blur you are, you are imposing on the first column in the F, and then when you assume it was zero and 100. Uh, so that's kind of a, uh, what we are talking about in terms of artifacts. Um, you're doing sharpening, it's, it's different artifacts for different operators that we are talking about in here. Uh, so um, 
the, 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 there's really no specific, um, uh, specific, uh, uh, you know, de facto, uh, which one, uh, you should, you should go with. Uh, it, it's very, very common that we, we, we have to be mindful of the fact that the boundaries, the edges around the image are being treated a little bit differently from the rest of the image based on our operator edge, uh, as we see. Um, okay, so we'll talk more about uh, image arithmetic. Uh, and these are really straightforward. Uh, it's really nothing but toy examples. Uh, we we'll talk a little bit about our fine operations, which we'll be using uh, later on. We'll talk about motion estimation and video coding. Um, so, uh, in addition, it's very obvious um, you're adding point by point, pixel by pixel. Uh, so, you're adding these values. As far as uh, you are really normalizing, you're normalizing across both images or one or the output image. Um, you don't really want to get all saturate, saturation in the output, the output image. And then uh, same thing for subtraction, multiplication, and so on. Uh, in, uh, uh, in affine uh, operations, what we have is the following. Uh, we have, this is our input indices. And then we are scaling them with this operator A. A two by two, and then we have this summation. We sum with another two by one vector, and this will map the m and n into new indices k and l. So m will map to m will map to k, and l will map to l. And now, if you look at um, different special cases. It depends on the values in this two by two matrix A and this two by one vector B. Then we have different uh, situations. So the first one, if A is taking this form, which is one, zero, and zero, and one, then uh, what we have is a translation. So if you think about it, K is equal to M plus B1, and L will be equal to N plus B2. So, in this case, we are not really doing anything but translation, and the translation amount is determined by uh, the two dimensional, sorry, the two by one vector b, which is uh, the values b1 and b2 in this case. Uh, so that's the very special case of this affine transformation, and this is an example uh, in here. And if you keep in mind, I mentioned this uh, before, um, you can fix the lattice, you say, this is really my finite support region. I want to show this the image, that's fine. Or you say, since I am really mindful of the fact that part of the image will be outside, then I want to keep basically this whole thing as my region of support. That's fine. As far as you really are consistent, uh, and then either way, uh, it should be, should be okay. And then the next uh, special case, uh, when capital A is a function of theta, which is the rotation. So this is cosine theta, sine theta, negative sine theta, cosine theta. And then in this case, theta becomes how much rotation I have on the, in this operator. And then the center of that rotation is defined by this vector B, which is, we call it M naught and N naught. So this is the origin coordinate around which I'm rotating the image. If it's zero by zero, as in this case in here, then uh, what I'm doing is the rotation around the origin of the input image. So if, as in MATLAB, this is my pixel of zero and zero, then I'm rotating the image around this point. Or I can go and redefine B to be the center of the image, right? And then I rotate around that center of the image. So B in here determine uh, where uh, the center of that rotation is. In the special case, when I have uh, the center of rotation is zero and zero, and then my A in this case um, is uh, A zero and zero and B, uh, then what we are really uh, looking at in this case is what? Is I'm, I'm, I'm zooming or scaling, because in this case, what I will have is uh, K is A 
times uh, M, and then L is B times M, right? So now it depends on A and B, uh, then I'm really kind of like that zooming out, so I'm really down sampling, or I'm zooming in uh, up sampling in this case. So, uh, so this is another special case of the affine transformation uh, definition. Uh, here are some examples, and here in this example in here, if you notice uh, the dimension here in terms of number of pixels, and here is much bigger than this one here the as the input. Because when I was doing the rotation, I wanted to see the entire image in the output. Then here, I have these kind of just zeros. Uh, there's no value uh, in these pixels. So that's one rotation, and in this case, uh, the rotation center is at the center of the image. Uh, in the image. And then we have logical operations. Uh, yes, uh, B as a vector for the affine transformation is the center of uh, uh, of the rotation, right? It's M not and M not in this case. So uh, logical operations, uh, I may spend a little bit more time than usual on morphological operations, but when we talk about um, detection and estimation, uh, especially detection, uh, usually there is a, after the thresholding, you have a step uh, of morphological operations where you have quite a bit of these and or not operations uh, happen. Uh, so here's some examples in here uh, of these kind of straightforward uh, and and or or not. Uh, so the negative, for example, uh, example. But we'll talk more about these, how we use them. we we'll talk about detection, uh, of point detection, line detection, uh, and then uh, segmentation as well. Uh, usually what happens, um, so, for example, in, in, in let's say a very simple edge detection algorithm, um, you give you because of vari variations in, 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 in quality, in noise, and in, in sharpness in the input image, you have a line that's really connected. However, your edge detection algorithm gave you only two parts, and there is a gap in between. Um, so, we use morphological operation using this logical arithmetics. To connect these two together, um, and this is quite a bit of uh, morphological operations to get those connected after the fact. So this is again back to what I was talking about uh, in the first week. Um, always in image processing, you have a pipeline of uh, of um, of blocks. Uh, so there's pre-processing, processing, and then you have post-processing, uh, which usually have morphological operations in segmentation and. Um, um, there is a question on uh, when you zoom with a equal to 2, so that basically means k equal 2 times m, how do we fill in the pixels? We'll talk about that in interpolation. On Thursday, I will show you some examples of interpolation, and then next week we'll talk more about um, what are the basic algorithms to do interpolation. Um, there are quite a bit of uh, new methodology under, if you look, uh, the most common application nowadays called super resolution. There is a thousand, thousands of papers. Um, how do you do super resolution, either in the frequency domain, spatial domain, and in recent years using neural networks as well. Uh, so that's called interpolation. How do you do interpolation between, uh, we'll talk about I'll give you the basics of this uh, examples on Thursday, and then next week I'll give you the very, very basic of this interpolation uh, algorithms. Uh, okay, good questions. Um, frequency response. Um, so we have an input signal X, we have our output Y, we have an input response H, and now let's really assume that I would like to describe uh, X the input um, as a complex uh, amplitude, uh, exponential, sorry, amplitude. Uh, and in this case, we usually have A, but let me just say A is equal to one. So we'll have A e to the J omega one M and omega two M. And now basically we have two dimensional signal. Then we have really two uh, frequency components, omega one and omega two, one in the X direction, 
and one in the y direction. In other words, um, there is a periodicity in x in the x direction with omega, defined by omega 1, which is 2 pi uh, uh, hertz, that is the frequency in hertz. And then we have a periodicity in the y direction defined by our omega 2. If, um, and if you look at this, this is nothing really but an extension from the 1D case. We used to tell you x of n is nothing but equal to a e to the j omega n. Right? Where omega is a is a non frequency, we call it omega naught sometimes as well. So if that's the assumption, uh, then we can look at how we can calculate the output y using double summation uh, definition of two dimensional convolution over k and l. I have shift and mirror in the, k, uh, in the x. So I have x of n minus k n minus l, and then I have h of k and l. So now I know that x is defined by this exponential, so I can replace that x of n minus k n minus l with the definition here. Then I have e to the j omega 1 m minus k and e to the j omega 2 n minus l as underlined in the green line. And I keep just basically rearranging terms. Now uh, I can take e to the j omega 1 m outside the double summation because it doesn't depend on k and l. I do the same thing for e to the j omega 2 n because it doesn't really depend on k and l. And this is what I will have left. If you notice, this is nothing but what? This is really our m plus signal x of m and n. And here, this is a quantity, right? And we'll call this quantity because we are summing over k and l. Then it will be a function of omega 1 and omega 2. In other words, if I have a complex exponential as an input, um, then I can use the impulse response h to calculate how I can scale the input, which is this. I can scale it magnitude-wise, which is the magnitude of our h, and phase-wise. Yeah, so I can shift. I can shift the phase of the input based on the input response, and they can scale the amplitude of the input uh, based on the input response as well. So this is going to refresh what is really the definition of a frequency response. So this is another way to describe uh, a system. Um, so the small h of k and l as the input response. Now we have another uh, way, which is the frequency response. And in this case is the natural extension of the 1D. Now we have two dimensions, one in the X direction, the other one is in the Y direction in, in this case. Um, okay, so now um, we can really write uh, or scale the input with this H of mg1, mg2. And the easiest just to think about it, I'm scaling the amplitude of the uh, input with the magnitude of capital H and scale or shifting the phase of the input uh, with the phase of capital H at omega 1 and omega 2. Remember, omega 1 and omega 2, these are the two frequency components in our input X. And in the undergraduate signal processing, if you remember, if you can write the input into different frequency components, uh, then for every single input um, frequency, you really scale uh, the input by the amplitude uh, and the phase uh, as evaluated using the capital H or the inverse response. Uh, same, same methodology in this case. So now we can rewrite our frequency response, a double summation over M and N. And now uh, we have H of M and N, and we have E to the negative J omega one M and E to the negative J omega two M in this case. So now uh, this frequency response is periodic in both omega 1 and omega 2 with a periodicity of 2 pi in each direction. Another important uh, observation is that our inverse response is discrete. Our frequency response in here is continuous in the frequency domain omega 1 and omega 2. And that's why we're using these parentheses in here. Uh, once we get to the DFT, then we'll talk more about how we can evaluate this and calculate using Fourier transform, the discrete Fourier transform. 
but for now, for analytical purposes, uh, this is a continuous function in uh, both components, omega 1 and omega 2. Let's illustrate this by an example uh, before I get to the questions. Assume that our uh, inverse response is defined by these uh, four samples. Um, so wherever we have a red, the value is one. Everywhere else is a zero. I could write this as h of m and n is equal to delta of m minus one n, which is this one here. And then the second one is this one here, delta of m. Uh, sorry, this is the second one. m plus one uh, and n. This one here is delta of n and n minus one. And finally, this one is delta of m and n plus one. So we have four samples uh, in our inverse response, small h. And h. So now I just want to plug in the definition of the frequency response, double summation, h of m and n and e to the complex uh, or the complex exponents uh, in terms of omega one n and omega two n. Um, and then what I will do, I will replace h of m and n with the four sample. So we'll have this double summation will translate into four terms. The first one, I have delta of m minus one n is the same. Delta of m plus one and n, same. Delta of m and n minus one, delta of m and n plus one. Right? Now this, we have these four terms. Um, the next thing is to evaluate. So now, this will be equal to one when m is equal to one. So this will be one and this will be zero. n is equal to a zero, m equal to one. That will give me e to the negative j omega one. Here, this will be equal to one when m is negative one and n is equal to a zero. So this m in here is negative one and then n here is a zero. That will give me e to the j omega one. And then the third term, delta of m and n minus one. And in this case, this will be equal to one when m is equal to a zero and n is equal to a one. So m is zero, n is one. That will give me the to j omega two. This one here will be equal to one when m is zero and n is negative one. So this is zero, this is negative one. That will give me e to the j omega two. So now from Euler's formula, we know this e to the negative j omega one plus e to the j omega two um, with nothing but two cosine omega one. The same thing for the second term, e to the negative j omega two plus e to the j omega two from Euler's formula is two cosine omega two. So the frequency response is two cosine omega one plus two cosine omega two in this, in this case. Okay, so there's question, two questions. One is, uh, so one question, what does a change of phase uh, do to uh, an image? So uh, it depends on what we are really, uh, so remember, uh, if you have an image, there is the intensity values, right? So every single pixel intensity values. What uh, we are referring to the smooth image, that means the frequency content there is either the DC or is low frequency. If we have sharp edges, that means it's high frequency. So those are really contribute, these are frequency content. Okay? Now, when you are doing some, 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 some operations in these images, what you are looking at, you are looking at the magnitude, right? you are really plotting the magnitude. Now, <coughs> you will look when we talk about DFT later on, how can we use the phase of of uh, of uh, of, uh, of these images, what, what what which is rarely used it's, uh, in computational images, they are used more than in natural images. Uh, but we'll talk some some examples of what happens to the phase of the image um, when you are scaling it, when you are shifting it. Uh, the whole idea is that you are be shifting the frequency content right um, over the frequency spectrum. Uh, um, so this is really kind of the frequency response. You can plot uh, capital H of omega one and omega two in this case. Uh, this is another exercise by hand. This is H of M and N. 
what would be the frequency response h of omega one and omega two it's just a tedious task uh, but at the end of the day it will have four four terms as uh, as given in this solution uh, wow. so we can talk more about um, the other way around and um, we'll have an example on this uh, in a minute uh, what about the, getting the impulse response from the frequency response? Um, you remember in the 1D case, um, uh, the frequency response is a continuous signal in the frequency domain. And when we go and do the the, the, the impulse response or the inverse uh, free transform in this case, uh, using the Fourier series expansion, um, we have the integral. Um, the integral uh, over the period negative pi to pi in the omega domain, right? Uh, same expansion here. We have double integral, uh, negative pi to pi, in both direction, omega 1 and omega 2. And this is really the definition of the, of the, uh, of the input response using a frequency response. Um, this term in here is 1 over 2 pi times 1 over 2 pi. Uh, different textbook, different materials online. Uh, they will have different definition here. They have the 2 pi uh, going from the frequency, uh, response to frequency response. Uh, so this is the definition we'll be following uh, uh, in, 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 in this course. Doesn't mean the other ones are wrong. It's just uh, what we agree on or we use as a convention. So uh, as an example, uh, let's look at this. Uh, rectangular low pass filter. Uh, uh, this is uh, in the frequency domain. This is our frequency response. What this means is the following. This is a low pass filter. It means this is omega one, this is omega two. What means within this rectangular, everything is one, outside everything is zero. So I'm allowing low, uh, low frequency component in the x direction and low frequency component in the y direction to be maintained. And then I'm blocking out, or filtering out everything outside this rectangular region. So this is really the same definition of the low pass filter that we had in the 1D case, but now I have a second dimension in this case. Um, so if you think about what this means is that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm all the sharp, very, very sharp edges in my image uh, either horizontal or vertical, I'm getting rid of these. Uh, so I'm, I'm only allowing the low frequency one. So if I apply this to an image, the output would be a blurry image, um, meaning that uh, the sharp uh, sharp edges will be uh, will be added there. So if I want to use the definition of uh, getting the impulse response to the frequency response, h of m and n, 1 over 4 pi squared, and then here's this integral between negative pi and pi. But now I have really A and B defining uh, the width and the height of our low pass filter. Again, A uh, and B are less than pi. Uh, so I can replace that with negative A to A because anything outside between A and pi and between negative pi and negative A is zero. Uh, and the chemical H magnitude in this case is all one. And then I have the complex component uh, exponentials in here, e to the j omega 1 m, e to j omega 2 n, uh, as they are. Uh, so um, <laughs> I can rearrange terms. Um, so this is really with the respect to omega 1, this term for the, this integral with respect to omega 2. And then uh, this is a very simple one, will give me a same function, right? Um, so now this is nothing but a product of a sync function in the n direction, another sync function in the n direction. And if you look at the one, the, the one dimensional case is the same thing when you have a, a low pass filter uh, uniform, uh, it will give you also a sync function uh, as your uh, inverse response. And again, um, if you look carefully at the frequency response itself, we know this is separable, is a product of two uh, uh, u of uh, basically a, a, step, a, a step function in the x direction, a step function in the y direction. And if you look carefully at the input response, is also a separable, is the product of two 
same function uh, one in each of the two directions x and y. Uh, this question here, can you multiply? Yes, um, that's multiplication is scaling. Uh, yes, it's not really a multiplication because it, it's, uh, remember, our input, I can define it as capital A times e to the j omega 1m and e to the j omega 2m. So it has uh, two dimensional, uh, so it has a very simply an amplitude and the phase. And then capital H, I'm evaluating capital H at omega 1 and omega 2. These are the input, the frequency uh, of the imp in the input signal, right? So I'm evaluating capital H at omega 1 and omega 2. What that evaluation will give me will give me a complex number. It has an amplitude and has a phase. And then I'm scaling my input X, which is a complex exponent. I'm scaling it uh, amplitude-wise, and I'm shifting the phase as well. Now, so that's really the, it's, it's, it's not really a product, it's a, it's a scaling. Uh, if, if you take that product, the assumption is correct because X is a complex exponent. I'm evaluating H at omega and omega two, which will give me complex numbers. That means I'm scaling X with a magnitude of H and this frequency in the com, uh, components. And I'm shifting input X phase wise with the evaluation of uh, the operator capital H or the frequency response at omega one and omega two in this in this uh, in this case. Um, so uh, that's basically what what we are really trying to uh, to uh, to do uh, in in that in that evaluation. Now, uh, so there is a, an example. Uh, I think it's in your problems number two or three. Uh, where we are taking this, um, this rectangle and we are making it a diamond in this case. And uh, uh, we are asking you to do the same process. Uh, so in here, what you need to impose is the features of the properties of the free transform because if you do the integration, it will be very tedious uh, in this case. Uh, so we'll look at some of the properties uh, in, in a minute. Uh, so, uh, definition of a free transform. Um, this is the definition of free transform. Uh, and uh, we'll have uh, our own lecture on how we plot this, how we differentiate between this and uh, for a discrete free transform, uh, and, and how we can use DFT to go to DCT and DST, which we'll be using in image coding uh, later on. But for now, uh, in this context of, of this part of the course, uh, the definition of the free transform of a discrete signal. So this is a digital signal f of m and n. Uh, that's basically, it has a sample lattice. For now, we're assuming the lattice is rectangular, meaning I have x and y, so it's linear to each other. And then I'm defining the free transform, which is continuous in the omega one and omega two. Omega one is the frequency uh, in the x direction. Omega two is the frequency in the y direction. Uh, then by definition, uh, this is the free transform uh, in the 2D case. And the inverse one is what we had before, uh, double integration between negative pi and pi, and will give me double integration over this continuous signal, will give me this discrete f of m and n signal. Now, the assumption here is that uh, this is doable, this exists, uh, if the uh, small f of m and n is absolutely solvable, meaning the summation over m and n of all values of f of m and n are less than uh, infinity, meaning that they are finite. Mm -hmm. um, what really uh, uh, we'll be using uh, is this notation here. Uh, we are really using new and new components as we'll be using it heavily, uh, not really omega and omega two. Uh, if you think about it, just omega one is a new times two pi, and omega two is new times two pi in this case. Since we are using this normalized frequency contents uh, or indices in mu and mu, uh, then by definition, this in here will go, uh, it used to be negative pi to pi, with this normalization divided by two pi, this will be negative half to half. So we have a tile over a, 
a finite, um, actually a, a unit, a unit type. So the normalized frequency quantum. Uh, this one that I will be using in the sampling deviation mixed. We'll talk more later about how you plot this, uh, how, uh, but uh, you go to any function in the information toolbox or in DPK, um, the way we, we really uh, calculate uh, and visualize the free transform of two dimensional signals or images, uh, we apply this, what we call an FFT shift. Uh, so we are shifting uh, so that uh, zero basically zero and zero DC value as at the center. And you can think of this, this is going from negative pi to pi, or in the normalized case, negative one half to one half. And in the Y case, negative pi to pi, or negative one half in the normalized case to one half. Um, so what this means, uh, that means anything on this line here, right? It has only content uh, that is really changing or has a frequency or variation in the content in the x direction it has zero variation in the y axis right vertically and the same thing for this line here, right and vice versa for these components mm -hmm. this one here right means we have the highest basically um, variations all these corners here. the highest frequency of variations uh, in both the x and the y direction uh, in, in this case. Uh, so this is how we visualize um, these uh, three transforms. To get to DFT, uh, we will just look at that code, uh, but it's nothing but you apply your three transform, discrete three transform, then you apply a shift. So basically the center for all the four quadrants is at the, at the center here. And this is only for visualization, just only for us to look at uh, the image because of the symmetry in the, in the DFT property. Uh, I'll get the questions in a minute. Uh, maybe this is a good time to look at the questions. What do you do? Uh, I had a question. Uh, do you want sure. me to just type it or? Yeah, please go ahead. Yes. Uh, so on the homework, there were some DTFT questions that were not starred. Um, whenever there's a concept you communicate in lecture that doesn't appear in the homework, do we assume that that will be tested? Of course, yes. Uh, as I mentioned the first week, uh, uh, actually the homework, if you look at the second problem set, it has more content than what we had in the lecture, right? Um, and mm -hmm. the reason is that, uh, all the starred ones, you will be able to solve as soon as we finish today. The, the unstarred one, the ones I didn't start. Uh, so when you talk about sampling on Thursday, you will be able to solve them, but I, I am starting because you may not have time after the lecture on Thursday to solve for these. But I have them there for the practice because the sampling as a material will be in the exam, uh, will be in the, in the first exam, right? Uh, so DTFT, um, so is discrete time for your transform. It is exactly what we're talking about in this case. Uh, is uh, the signal is discrete, we're applying for your transform. So this free transform here, it is the extension of the one dimension DTFT. Right? So this is really the, but I don't want to call it DTFT uh, because we don't really have time, but it's, it's spatial. But it's the same concept. What we're studying now is uh, free transform which is continuous in the frequency domain applied to a discrete signal, uh, which is FFM and Did I answer your question? Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, will it be B or the one? Okay, I'm, I'm not getting into some of the questions, but um, this question about how can you tell if this is a low pass filter? Um, um, in the frequency domain, if you look at the rectangle, it was a. Here. This is a low pass filter, right? In the uh, 
we are passing the DC and the low frequency content in the X direction as well as in the Y direction, right? Um, so um, as an idea, um, you think about in the in the 1D case, if this is the zero frequency, then anything around here is a low pass filter, right? It's a low frequency content. So I'm passing this is zero. Uh, I'm passing the DC and the low frequency content and filtering out the high frequency content. This one here is a two dimensional extension, is a rectangular extension. I'm just doing the same thing in the X direction and the Y direction. I'm looking at the product of these two, right? Uh, so uh, and, uh, everything in here is a DC or a low frequency. Um, component in the omega-1, omega-2 space. That's a low-pass filter. I still have content in here and here in my input signal maybe, but I'm filtering everything out because everything outside is still turning with zero. So I can look at the low-pass filter from the frequency response much, much easier. And there are questions in the problem set number two, um, where we are asking basically question, what does this filter do? Um, and that's just what we're looking at. Uh, it's a low-pass filter. It's a high-pass filter, right? Uh, the high-pass filter is the inverse of the low-pass filter in operation, meaning passing out the, the, the passing the uh, the high-frequency content, filtering out the low-frequency content, uh, or maybe a medium-pass uh, filter. Uh, So forget about um, images. Just look at the two-dimensional signal, uh, f of m and n. Now, um, any signal, um, it has a frequency component, a frequency content. It has non-zero content at a certain frequency in the frequency spectrum, right? So now, when we have an impulse response, we can do the two-dimensional convolution between a small h and the input f, and then we can get the output g. That's always our goal, right? Uh, that's basically how we do convolution. That's how we do filtering. That's how we process, right? So we have a small f n, small h is the filter, and then we do the convolution, right? So in, in, in the cases where I can express my input, like in, as a sinusoid, for example, if I can express my input as uh, a magnitude, as a, as a complex exponent, as a magnitude and a phase at specific frequency content, like omega one or omega two, uh, if even just forget about one D or two D. It's a general case. I can express my input as a, a complex exponent at a certain frequency content. Right? Uh, um, if I have a sum of sinusoids, uh, then I can, or even a product of sinusoid, we know that there are multiple frequency content uh, based on, on on the individual sinusoid uh, frequencies. So what really matters in here, if that's the case, then it's really using uh, two-dimensional convolution to do that, or one-dimensional convolution to do the operation. I can utilize the fact that I can uh, evaluate the frequency response at every single frequency in the input signal. So in our case, the example in here, it was omega one and omega two as, as, as one basically value, right? Because it's a two dimensional vector. And then once I evaluate capital H at that omega one, omega two, or omega one only for one dimension case, then I have a complex number. It has a magnitude, it has a phase. Then all what I need to do to find the output is to shift to scale and shift, to scale the magnitude of the input signal with the value of the amplitude of capital H at the input frequency. And I shift the phase basically of the input signal. So what that means is, in this case, the same thing, remember this was a very fundamental idea in the undergraduate with one dimension. Uh, if I have an input sinusoid, I have a filter H, then the output, right, G, will have the same filter component as the first same, same, sorry, same frequency component. We have same frequencies going through, right? But now I'm scaling the 
the, the magnitude and the phase, right? So same frequency input will be at the output. The difference between the input and the output uh, can be only in the magnitude and the phase. Uh, if my input, I cannot express it easily using uh, uh, sinusoids or using complex exponents, then what I need to do is to do convolution. Uh, and then once we study DFT, we'll talk more in detail about how we can utilize DFT to do this whole operation um, uh, of convolution, what we call circular convolution, but we'll study that uh, at the other time. I hope this is clear uh, now. So back to this is all what we are limiting ourselves. We are not doing DFT. Uh, DFT will be later. We will talk about image transforms. All what we are doing, we have a discrete signal, we apply a Fourier transform to it. Now the Fourier transform is, is continuous in the frequency domain. Uh, whether it's 1D or 2D is the same. Uh, um, okay. Uh, okay. So these are uh, some properties, and uh, we, I will not really go through these in detail. I already kind of self explanatory. Uh, because they're really super uh, simple in terms of extension from the 1D case. But I want to highlight the important ones. Um, and this is something you remember very well. We have a convolution in the frequency domain. And this is what I was talking about when somebody was asking this product, right? Uh, so convolution in the, in the time domain or the spatial domain is the same as the product uh, in the frequency domain. And that's basically what that product that he was uh, or she was Pointing out, yes, it's a, it's a, I cannot multiply you know, small x of m and n times capital H of omega 1, omega 2, unless I'm expressing the small x in the frequency domain. Absolutely. Uh, so this is exactly what uh, what that property is talking about. Uh, uh, you know, the shift is, as before is really much changing the phase of the output uh, of the sorry of the signal. Uh, linearity is the same as before. Uh, these sort of transposition and reflections. Uh, you can do all of these if you can get the GUI to work. Uh, the GUI uh, is working on MATLAB 2018. Uh, I don't know if it works in 2020, uh, uh, but uh, we haven't upgraded uh, our MATLAB yet. Uh, <coughs> okay, I want to get to something. Uh, yes, this is separability is maintained in the spatial domain and the frequency domain. Right? Uh, this is something because the is a linear operation. Uh, and then, uh, yes, this one here. Uh, so the Fourier transform or a vertical line impulse. So you remember we talked about vertical lines last time and we said uh, if, our, uh, if our f of m and n is delta of n, that means a vertical line, I can write this as the product of delta m times one of n. What is this one of m? One of m means I have one everywhere. It doesn't matter what the value of n is, right? So the product between these two is nothing but what delta m. Now, if I want to use the property that what is really the Fourier transform of this f of m and n, it's a product of these two one-dimensional signals. The separable sequence. Now the frequency, the free transform. I take the free transform of delta. I take the free transform of one. And remember, when we have a delta of m, right? Um, when we have a, an impulse, then the free transform will be what all ones, like a white noise, right? All ones everywhere. So that's what we have. The free transform of delta of m is one. Mu. I'm using the normalized frequency in here, and then the free transform of one of n. So this is in the x axis in the spatial domain is one everywhere. That will uh, translate in the free in the frequency domain to be an impulse in the frequency domain. So I have delta of mu. Right? I'm again using normalized frequency mu and mu in this case. So if you look careful in here, if you're going to plot this in the mu and mu uh, space. Uh, what you will have is you have delta of mu, right? So what you will have in here is a horizontal line. 
So what you had in a spatial, do spatial domain is a vertical line in the frequency domain is a horizontal line um, and, and vice versa. So uh, that's something uh, you can generalize. If you have in the spatial domain, you have a line with a slope of negative capital P over Q. These are scalar numbers, P and Q. Then in the frequency domain, that will be represented by a line with a slope of capital Q over Q. As examples, if you look at, of course, in this example, I'm just highlighting uh, a major contributor in the frequency domain. I have this red uh, line that really has uh, high frequency content there. Um, this triplet in here is a major, but not the only contributor to that. And you can see between these two, they are perpendicular to each other. So uh, the, the product of their slope is negative. And the same thing, if I take this line here, I take this tripod in here, this leg, or the tripod, this is a major contributor. It's not the only contributor. Remember, uh, localization in the frequency domain is not contained. That means I cannot say this pixel belongs here, for example. It's, it's, a, it's about how much content I have uh, contribution from the spatial domain. So that's why I'm saying this is a major contributor uh, to this line. This is a major, but not the only contributor to, to this line. Mm -hmm. now, again, filtering um, this, if we take the cameraman as an input image, apply this low pass filter for uh, the question about what is low pass filter. You see, in this case, I'm not using a rectangle, I'm using kind of a disk. Um, and then outside this disk, everything is zero. Inside this disk, uh, um, um, everything is is, uh, is uh, cast. Um, so I can see um, this is a very blurry image compared to the original cameraman. Or I can do a high pass filter within the disk, everything is zero. Outside the disk, everything is one. So I'm passing the high frequency content. Uh, what I'm maintaining is the edges, right? the sharp like this. It depends on how big the disk and how small I'm passing more or passing less uh, high, high frequency content in the image. Uh, but I'm really getting rid of all the values in the DC in here, and all these values I've got. Uh, there's low, low frequency content. Uh, uh, just wanna make uh, this, uh, the grass, because of these variations, they are very, very localized, but they're still, uh, high variations, so you can see these are still have high frequency content. Uh, so that kind of variation is still passing through uh, through this filter. Uh, in here. Uh, and finally, uh, before uh, we conclude, uh, the parts of a relation, basically uh, the inner product between two dimensional signals, uh, two two dimensional signals uh, in the frequency domain uh, is basically uh, equal to the inner product uh, between their Fourier transform in the frequency in the frequency domain. So the energy is preserved um, in, in both in both domains in this case. And if we plot um, the Fourier transform man Q square, uh, that is defined as the energy density spectrum uh, of the signal F in this case. Um, at the end in here, uh, these are the the table of free transform that we'll be using for your own reference. Um, so very quick access to the whole uh, free transform property. And then uh, over the years, we maintained a uh, formula sheet uh, for the cases when we used to have the exams in a class, but also equally important to have some kind of a reference, a very quick reference to put everything together. Uh, I will be uh, updating that. Uh, formula sheet and I will be sharing it. Uh, it has content from later in the semester materials, uh, but I will go ahead and uh, post what I can have by the end of the week and then um, uh, we'll just have a look and access to 